being a seven year old girl and having a grown man look at your breasts and you, in between your legs. It's just a, a balling. How uncomfortable it made me feel whenever I wasn't even supposed to know what those looks meant. Okay, Victoria. Victoria, where are you from originally? Um, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. And I grew up in foster homes. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. Did you ever have your mom or dad? I didn't meet my um, father until I was seven. And um, it was just a short couple of years that I uh, visited with him. Um, and there was an alcoholic incident on my 10th birthday. <laughs> and uh, I didn't get to see my dad again um, until I was 20. And uh, he passed away when I was 23. So, so did you have parents? I, uh, I met my mother uh, when I was 15 in the penitentiary for murder. Um, and I stayed with the original foster family from six months until I was 13. Um, I was basically their slave. Um, my foster brother sexually molested me. So I grew up in um, my original foster home from six months to 13 years. My uh, foster brother that was about 10 years older than me molested me sexually. Um, I would black out and I knew the boogie band was coming. Um, I could smell him and uh, later I learned it was dirty scrotum. <laughs> And um, I would have to take off all my clothes and cover up with just the sheet. And um, I would wake up in the morning, it would just be another day. Um, incredibly, um, people ask me um, in the profession that I'm in now, uh, uh, how did I get so good at what I do? And it was because I was molested since I was seven. And um, I pretty much, you know, do everything the same way. Uh, I like to add my own sass and pizzazz, but um, I basically do everything the same way that I was taught when I was a child. Uh, my foster parents used to uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, and uh, financially abuse me. And um, so, Sometimes I was made in, to stand in the corner for 10 hours uh, because I was five minutes late coming back from my girlfriend's house. One time we took a family photo and um, they always went to uh, the Sears store and had uh, portraits made of them. And then they'd come home and my foster dad would take pictures of the whole family for the Christmas pictures. One time, there was a kid named Tony with us, and I was a, I was the one that took care of all the children that came in the home. I had to wash them, feed them, and take care of them. And uh, we were uh, <laughs> we were at a uh, neighbor's house, uh, and uh, he kept taking candy out of the candy dish. And I told my foster mom when they got back. I had to report. She gave him a black eye. I was this big. I sat him down in front of the camera with the family and took the picture. He was crying like me right after it happened. I learned from that day forward to never be a snitch. So uh, anyway, when I was 13, I kind of became a rebel, and uh, 13, I, I uh, took the car and wrecked it, <laughs> and um, all the kids were harassing me and shit in the neighborhood, so pardon my friend. Um, so I told them, get me out of here, I'm going to run away, and so they uh, put me in a group home, and um, I had uh, already uh, tried uh, marijuana. Um, and was smoking cigarettes. So at the age of 10, I started. Um, and then at 13, every, I started smoking cigarettes every day, and marijuana every day. And I ended up going to uh, actually two other foster homes. The next one uh, was with a woman uh, that I believe truly was a mother. She had been a victim of rape. 
and had two twins uh, by the uh, rape, by her rapist, and I raised him. And uh, she raised me, but she was with a uh, gentleman that I was starting to groom me and uh, molest me. And uh, she caught him uh, French kissing me, and I was on my knees in between. I was on my knees in between his legs, and she caught it and moved us out. And uh, she had a house, and we moved into the house until she uh, met uh, another man shortly after that. And she married him, and um, I took her car for a joy ride <laughs> again. <laughs> and wrecked it in the pasture and uh, they threw me out and so I went to my uh, pastor's home nobody else wanted me and so I went to my pastor's home until I graduated uh, high school um, I was 19 when I graduated high school and um, uh, I was 15 out of 25 people in my graduating class um, during high school I would uh, go out in the morning, collect the chicken eggs from the chickens. I would uh, castrate the uh, steers in the cattle uh, in the springtime, roll out the bales of hay for the cattle, uh, work in the garden, and um, mess with the horses and stuff, you know. And so uh, when I graduated high school, I got married one week out of high school, and that marriage lasted about nine months. Um, it, uh, he, did, he just quit working in our relationship and um, I was the only one that was making the bread in, in the, in the uh, relationship and I left and uh, he got a job uh, later to uh, divorce me. <laughs> so all I wanted him was to get a job. <laughs> and so he got a job to divorce me. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I uh, had a little studio apartment. I worked uh, two or three jobs. Um, in order to maintain that and um, had some tumultual, tumultuous uh, abusive relationships and I ended up in uh, St. Louis, Missouri um, in 2001 I was, uh, well I was 20, I was getting a liquor on my uh, fake ID <laughs> and um, so uh, then um, I met my uh, second husband and that was my baby's daddy and um, we had the baby, but his uh, company was transferring to uh, a more uh, central uh, area for them to uh, uh, ship their product from. And we decided we would take the baby and uh, go move with his family in Pennsylvania uh, so we could raise my son with his family because I, I didn't ever have any. And really by the time I, I met uh, the rest of my family, they were older than me and um, we just didn't have a connection. So, and it was ironic that my foster family had the same number of boys and girls in sequence as my real mother did. So they had, including me, they had five, and it went boy, girl, boy, boy, girl, and my mother had five children, um, and they were pretty much the same ages. So it was kind of ironic, you know, that, but anyway, um, so, uh, we decided we go to Pennsylvania and uh, try to raise the baby there. He couldn't get a job and uh, fell into a deep depression. And um, I had spent a little bit of money on some clothes because my maternity clothes were hanging on me. And so because I was the bread winner at the time, I made the decision to buy some clothes. And when I got home, uh, I was beaten and um, my jaw broke it. And uh, I left, and um, his mother had a baby at the time, so I uh, I went back and um, pleaded with him to take the job in Georgia, and uh, so we did. Uh, and off we went to uh, Georgia, and uh, I spent uh, 11 years in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, the uh, relationship with him and I. Uh, I just didn't trust, and um, after he did that, I just, I couldn't trust, and um, he had this idea of me being a stay-at-home mother, and uh, because I had always taken my care of myself, even from a young age, seven, I couldn't depend on a man to take care of me, and I kept my job, 
and uh, I wanted to be a working mother. And so I was uh, abused and ridiculed uh, for that. And I left. Um, I left when my baby was two. And um, I didn't take my son uh, because uh, <laughs> he told me he'd slit my throat like OJ did the roll. And he looked in my eyes and he said it, and I knew he was serious. And so I left. I left with the baby with him and continued my life. Uh, we had a pallet business and uh, we were bringing in $6,000 cash a month alone just from the pallet business. And he told me I didn't have to pay child support as my part of the business. And so I left and we had a uh, agreement written up, uh, but unfortunately it was uh, written up incorrectly. Uh, the judge, when it went through, said, this is backwards, you need to have it correctly written and resubmit and I will approve. And, and then, of course, we couldn't find the guy. He, he took our money and took off. And so uh, I had paid for it as part of our agreement. And um, so the paperwork didn't get uh, drawn up or taken back to court for a year and a half. And um, during that time, I had two jobs to maintain the two-bedroom apartment I had for my uh, my son and I when I got custody of him. And then, uh, come to find out, uh, my uh, roommate, I got a roommate during the time that the process was going through to help me pay for the apartment. We would buy uh, groceries and things together. And so when Christmas, uh, I was paying for it and she put her stuff uh, in with mine and mine had my son's diapers and toys for Christmas and all that and she had personals in there, uh, condoms, shampoo, bath soap and so when the, the receipt was discovered uh, by his lawyer when we took it back for custody um, because of the laws in uh, Georgia if you can prove that there's infidelity in the relationship, you're awarded. You know, you win the case. And they found the receipt for the box of condoms. Took my childhood as instability, and I lost, uh, I lost custody of my son. <laughs> and it was devastating for me. Uh, it was devastating for me because I lived my life right. And I lived my life to the best that I could. And I, I loved my son. Um, I did everything for my son that I could. Um, during the time I wasn't able to maintain, a, you know, like two consecutive days together or two jobs I had in my days off sporadically, I would go get my son. But uh, it wasn't a lot of together quality time. Um, and they also felt that that was unstable uh, for my son. Uh, so I was uh, basically picked apart in the courtroom. I lost custody of my son and he was awarded $400 a month child support, which was 25% of both of my incomes. And so uh, I had to go bankrupt. It, it ruined me financially, based all on lies, you know, and so uh, deception. Um, in order to win, you know. And so, uh, as most bullies do, you know, bullies do that kind of thing. So, uh, I quit my jobs and uh, went into a temporary service. And I was uh, looking for an administrative position. Um, during the time that Atma U.S. Healthcare was uh, merging, I was working as a temp uh, for the office manager of uh, U.S. Health, uh, U.S. Aetna U.S. Healthcare. Um, I was subject to uh, um, sexual harassment uh, from my boss. I had to, um, I had to uh, orally uh, take care of him in order to keep my position. Um, but in the uh, in the process of that, I uh, met my fiance of four and a half years and um, he he was my light you know I am um, he took care of me 
best anyone probably has ever taken care of me in my life. But um, his wife had passed away after 28 years, and uh, I figured, you know, in the beginning that, uh, you know, his drinking would be bad, but it would get better. But at the end of our four and a half year relationship, um, we'd only had one domestic dispute. It, it did involve a gun. Um, however, uh, you know, we work things out in the relationship. Uh, we wouldn't discuss our problems uh, in the heat and of anger while we were drinking um, and it, it worked out it was uh, it was nice and uh, he'd asked me several times at the beginning of the relationship if I would marry him and I couldn't trust him through the trauma I couldn't commit um, until I knew and spend some time and I asked him if I could I wore his ring for the four and a half years and I asked him if I could uh, ask him to marry me when I felt right and so I did and at the end of the four and a half years he told me no and so uh, I decided to leave um, there wasn't anything left we couldn't move forward and so I left and uh, I got into uh, ecstasy I was taking ecstasy and uh, cocaine at that time that was uh, I first tried ecstasy and um I was drinking, I was a full-blown alcoholic at that point. Um, I was taking ecstasy, I went to uh, powder cocaine, and I uh, got into some uh, BDSM uh, websites and um, just sex websites, adult for finder. And so, <clears throat> I was, uh, you know, doing threesomes, I was a swinger, I was, um, having a time of my life I thought <laughs> I thought you know I experienced a lot of different things sexually um, kinky a lot of kinky things um, I met my third husband um, through those sites uh, and the first time that we were ever together was um, New Year's of uh, 2000 and, um, 2002 and uh, we had a, 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 a sex party. There was uh, six couples there um, and uh, basically we all watched him do all the women and uh, I wanted to try a uh, threesome you know with two men and me and um, the guy that was uh, behind me he went soft and so I never really got to experience that but uh, I thought in the back of my mind that maybe I might have a problem um, with this guy uh, he seemed to be too all put together, but uh, very experimental sexually. Uh, we built a dungeon in our uh, house. We had a lakefront home in Atlanta, Georgia. We had uh, 500 feet of lakefront property. I had a car, my dreams. Uh, he had a car, his dreams. We had a Harley, and I thought I was on top of the world. Um, but I thought I had a problem with him. I thought he might be a uh, sexual predator or, or just be a uh, nymphomaniac, <laughs> you know. Uh, I did everything with him that he wanted me to do uh, sexually. We had all kinds of sex toys. We had a dungeon in our, room, our uh, house. I would go and um, he had went through a DUI and lost his license. And so he was uh, continuing to be on the sexual sites because he wanted to find a slave for us that could drive him so he could continue to do his uh, construction work and then take care of his business throughout the day. And I was all for it. And I would bring girls home from the city and drive them back out to the lake home uh, for him to interview us to, you know, see how they felt with us and see how they would fit. And um, one particular night I brought this uh, woman out in a I had to go to work the next day, so I went to bed, and I woke up to him coming in uh, frantically, uh, trying to get my get me to wake up. And she said she's calling 911. She says I threatened her with my nine-inch knife, which I knew what what it was, you know, his dick. And I knew that it was true without even talking to the girl. But I had to protect my husband. And so the police got there and um, she's drunk. 
standing on our steps and um they're telling us they're going to shoot the dog if we don't get the dog off off the police because it was you know vicious and I went to step down the, the steps the police officers were to my left she was to my right and I bumped her and she flew over the rail of the steps and landed on her head and went unconscious and uh, they arrested me uh, for assault and battery and uh, that was the first time that I had ever um, been to uh, to jail it was I stayed in the holding tank and, and he got me out um, but uh, you know he got me out and everything was cool and, and I, I never cheated on him I bet he constantly uh, accused me of cheating and I figured it was the guilt because he was doing the same thing to me I had clothes and stuff uh, in the house and I had cleaned all of his uh, daughter's clothes out of the house and so uh, I had a uh, position a uh, very prestigious position, uh, payroll and benefits administrator for a utility, it's a company in a corporate office. And I did all the uh, benefits and payroll for 120 union employees. I was making, I was bringing home over $4,000 a month in Atlanta and our bills only amounted about 1200 So we had plenty of money to do what we wanted to do, what we wanted to have and everything. And. Um, but he would harass me at work and try to get me fired. They tried to get me fired uh, because of him. And um, so I left the company. And um, we got a uh, construction, and we started his construction remodeling company uh, back up. And um, I knew that he couldn't do what he used to do whenever I was at work, once I was at home. And um, the physical abuse became more severe. He would choke me, uh, choke me out, uh, punch me, uh, push me, uh, maybe in the upper torso, um, tell me to shut up and call me names in front of the uh, construction crew. And so he decided that we were going to take a uh, trip to Florida. And um, I thought it was going to be really cool. Yeah, but I had to drive, and uh, when I got down there, I had a migraine headache, and so we had put the two uh, boys that were 12 and 13 in their own cabin, and we had our own cabin, and I said I was going to go take a nap, and when I woke up, he was gone, and the boys were in their cabin, and he was gone for hours, and hours and hours, and I even went and looked for him. And I knew that he probably went down and met somebody and, you know, was off, you know, having a sex sex capade. But I was just tired. I was tired of it. I wanted to know what I wasn't doing sexually for him. Because I gave him everything he wanted and asked for sexually with enthusiasm, you know, above and beyond. And, you know, you just can't please. You can't please that type of person ever. They just want more and more and more. You can give everything you have of yourself and never get the uh, acceptance or love that you're looking for. And so uh, when he got back, I had uh, I had cut the rope to the latch on the door and uh, locked the uh, window so he couldn't get in the cabin and I set his things outside. He broke the window to the cabin, came in, took my phone so I could call 911, punched me, threw me against the log headboard of the bed, which uh, broke my back, and uh, dragged me to the middle of the bed and <laughs> sat on me, full weight, a six foot five, 210 pound man, sat on my chest, I strangled me and smothered me so I passed out for 10 hours. When I woke up, I had um, I had a huge bruise on my chin and my face. His handprint on my face and on my chin. And I knew I was in trouble. And uh, so when we got back, uh, 
I, I decided right then and there that I was going to leave him. And when we got back, uh, I went to the bank to take out my portion of the money. And uh, he had taken $30,000 out of the bank account and left me with nothing. And uh, I had secretly paid off some credit cards. And uh, I drove myself back to uh, Missouri from Georgia by myself. And um, I uh, took all the uh, construction equipment, commercial construction equipment that we had, because he took everything else out of the house that was of value. And that's how I made it to uh, Missouri. I became a uh, methamphetamine uh, intravenous drug user for uh, four and a half years. And I did anything and everything to maintain that addiction. Um, I sold, I shoplifted, I robbed people, I, uh, I had a, a sugar daddy. I ended up stabbing him because he abused me. I stabbed him five times. I punctured his lung. Cut him across here. I cut him across his chest. And uh, I, I had hit him twice in the lungs on the side. And uh, I have this scar here where I accidentally cut myself. Um, I didn't even feel it when it was cut, when they sold it without pain relievers, when it was healing or anything, and I knew I had a problem. <laughs> so, uh, he lied for me, and I didn't go to jail. CSI came to the hospital and asked me questions. And uh, I passed and got out of it. He was uh, one of four that I've stabbed in my life. Uh, most of it was uh, just protection uh, because they were uh, they were mean to me, and I didn't know why. They didn't have any reason to treat me that way, and so uh, because uh, my mother and my father are were both murderers. I've always been very scared of myself and my temper and um, I've always tried to be very mild-mannered. Uh, however, uh, now that I get older, I, uh, I don't have a lot of feeling. I cry for, uh, I cry for myself and I also cry for what I could do what I know I have in me and it it hurts and it's sad I uh, I left Missouri I had a sum of money um, and I left uh, my job I was in recovery uh, 2010 I got uh, sober from a 13 year alcoholic and four and a half year uh, intervening as crystal meth user and uh, my recovery was short lived um, I bounced uh, back and forth uh, with crack cocaine, methamphetamine, and um, uh, drinking. And uh, so uh, I never really, uh, from the apartment that I had in Georgia, I never got one, another apartment of my own until uh, 2012, I guess. Or no, uh, yeah, uh, two yeah, 2012. I had it for one year, and a um, girlfriend wanted me to come out to uh, California and, uh, you know, do the uh, whole uh, Sunshine Beach thing. And every day was going to be a party, and uh, that's what I've made it since I've been here. Um, there was some uh, recovery in there. I tried to uh, maintain my recovery. Uh, I uh, have a schizophrenia. Um, I'm schizoaffective, bipolar type. Uh, I call my personalities uh, Monica, Victoria, and uh, Baby Girl. And um, it started out as a joke, uh, but it's real. <laughs> and um, so uh, I came out here to California, and um, the second day I was out here, I had a gun put to my head. And uh, my best friend boyfriend said that I was disrespecting her and I 
just kept bouncing my forehead off his stomach, asking him to shoot me. I even got on my knees and looked at him straight in the eye. I wanted him to shoot me. I haven't ever wanted to live since I was seven. When everything started, <laughs> being a seven-year-old girl, and having a grown man look at your breasts and your, in between your legs, it's just a, a balling to me. How uncomfortable it made me feel whenever I wasn't even supposed to know what those looks meant. And so, uh, I left, uh, I was living with my uh, best friend. Uh, she gave me about two seconds to get out of her house when she thought the money was gone. And, um, she took all my clothes. I had spent, uh, two and a half days in the hot sun in New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico, trying to go through my clothes to, uh, figure out what I was going to bring. And, uh, I had about six to $7,000 worth of clothes in my, uh, Honda Civic, <laughs> and I made it all the way to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico before my car broke down. And so, uh, anyway, uh, those were all gone, you know, within a month of me being here. And, um, I, you know, I thought I could, uh, you know, bring out my nice clothes and, uh, you know, I could find a good sugar daddy and be in the, um, you know, the uh, higher class districts and, you know, maybe be okay, you know. I uh, went into recovery. I went into a battered women's shelter in Compton. Uh, it was a transitional living home. And uh, I just about drove myself crazy and was uh, insane. It drove me insane uh, to be in the shelter with the other women uh, because it's the, the same goal that anybody that's been abused makes a great abuser. And so I left there and. Um, I went to a, another mental health program, and um, during that time, I uh, created a, a housekeeping business, um, and I was I was doing you know well for what I thought four or five hundred dollars you know uh, every so often, and uh, that that carried me through. Uh, but then I uh, started smoking crack every day when I found out my mother died. Uh, she was the only one that cared about me uh, in the end. And she would send me a birthday card with a little bit of money in it. And uh, just I love you card here and there. And it meant so much to me. Uh, the first time anybody in my life that ever reached out like that to me. And so uh, I took it really hard because I knew it was the end of anybody that ever would care about me like that again in my life. And so, uh, I've been uh, doing drugs every day since, and it brought me down here. Uh, I didn't have any money to live, and my addiction was, uh, more important than maintaining any type of a house. It, uh, having a house didn't have any value. I, uh, you know, I've been camping every day, you know, since I've been down here. Well, for two and a half years, I did. And I love camping when I was a kid, you know. <laughs> so I looked at it just like it was just a big adventure, you know, camping. And then, you know, I uh, I had uh, one of the um, drug dealers down here uh, ask me, you know, if I wanted to try to start it. And they'd look out for me, you know. And uh, they gave me all the basics that I needed to know to do it. I started, uh, I started the... Uh, sex walker position, I guess, or a profession, uh, March 6, 2017, the first time I ever did it. I'm 49. Um, so, uh, it's been, um, uh, it's been good to me. I had my, uh, my run-ins, um, uh, not necessarily with my, uh, my clients or friends, who I call them, uh, but with, uh, the locals, um, uh, I've been um, lured into a tent and um, given crack with a GHB lace on it that I didn't know about. And I uh, came back two, two and a half hours later with my pants on, but my shirt all filthy, no bra, and my hair mess. And um, 
there was a piece of crack tossed to me and I asked the guy if I take this do I have to do anything to you and I walked out of the tent and I went up to the guy that lured me in there and I stabbed him I stabbed him and I walked away I don't go in tents anymore unless it's my help because uh, every time I've ever gone into another tent it hasn't been good um, I hear of uh, you know uh, specific tents around and that I need to stay away from them because they will drag you in and muzzle you and they will do what they want to do with you before I got put in uh, my temporary housing, uh, every night for three weeks on the street that I lived on, there was a woman screaming for help. Sometimes it was faint. Like they could last breath that they were taking for help. Other ones were uh, more energetic and more, uh, more loud and more uh, frantic. Uh, I figured those were ones that had just gotten dragged in and, and was trying to get away as quickly as they could. But it's none of my business that I couldn't say anything or th it would happen to me. Uh, I believe 95% uh, of my heart and soul and I have been told uh, by uh, six different people that uh, I would be uh, unconscious uh, and they would walk into my tent and uh, find men fondling my, uh, my uh, breast and pussy and ass. And uh, sometimes I would be uh, responsive but not myself and at the time I wouldn't. Um, I believe that was to uh, get a little bit of crack money. I figured probably my pussy was sold for five, my ass for ten maybe. So uh, the person that was lying to have a cook at high with his girlfriend. And um, even as we speak of, I uh, have people harass me. Um, people try to play tricks on me or get me caught up. Uh, they're trying to sneak into my apartment. I, I finally got my SRO which has been six years in the making. Um, I found out and it was uh, reconfirmed in uh, June that uh, I have a stage three, just stage four cancer. Vulvar. Uh, vulvar cancer. Um, and how you get that is uh, through the HPV virus. I have been uh, vaccinated against that and uh, I am not contagious uh, however um, I'm sure that it's moved to uh, stage four um, it's gone to my lip notes and a lot of people say you look great um, but I've lost a lot of weight um, and the weight that I do gain it quickly falls back off I'm constantly having to sleep and eat to try to gain the weight that I have um, People ask me if I'm pregnant because of my stomach and it's the, uh, the cancer spreading. Um, <laughs> all I ever wanted was uh, love, acceptance, and uh, peace in my life. And uh, for whatever reason, I've never been given that really in a brief instances throughout my life I have uh, I've been a survivor for 49 years I've uh, tried to commit suicide twice since I've been down here I uh, I slit this in a, my artery I was exposed I missed it and I don't know why. Uh, I cut this with a, uh, a straight razor. 
and I did this one uh, but I was too quick I just uh, barely opened the skin here and I took off running uh, with my arms up thinking that would uh, make the blood flow faster so I could die faster and uh, as anything with my life, it only um, made it coagulate. <laughs> and uh, I'm running around with the uh, open gashes in my arms <laughs> with dry blood. <laughs> I couldn't even, I was running to try to increase my heart rate so that the blood would flow faster. <laughs> and instead it only made it uh, coagulate faster and I'm running around with the, uh, you know, gashes. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I, uh, I've tried to deal with things as best as I could. Uh, the person that uh, has said that they loved me for two and a half years has uh, done everything that I could think of to uh, destroy me as a person. Try to take my heart and my soul, and I gave it my heart for a little while, and then took it back. Uh, he's thrown that huge can of enchilada sauce at me full, and beam him off my head, hit me with a 12-foot board, black my eye, beat my head, and torso. I have a bumps all over my head here, here, uh, here, uh, right back in here, uh, behind this ear, um, and I have a plastic prosthesis in this ear so I can hear, and there's a uh, huge bump here where I've been um, severely beaten. I am. Uh, somebody has said they love me. So uh, last year, uh, or this year, we were fighting a, I was in our tent and I tried four different ways of uh, trying to kill myself. <laughs> and I didn't even know. I uh, took a swing and uh, shot air. I found the impulse and I shot air into my artery and it didn't do anything. I took a tourniquet and tied it as tight as I could around my neck and it broke. I put a bag over my head and tied it with duct tape. It wasn't tight enough around my neck to keep the air in. And so he told me to take all my medication. So I did. Brand new prescription. Every single one of them. 90 pills. He called the ambulance, but when they came, I was still conscious and told him I didn't want any help. They let me go lay back down in the tent and left. When I came unconscious, he called him again. And they didn't want to take me. He begged him. He begged him to take me. I died in the emergency room. I stopped breathing. And why? I asked myself, why did he save me? Why did he save me? I don't know. I just thank God every day that I have the cancer. I think that because I don't have to uh, commit a sin to be able to have some mercy on myself or my soul. I thank God every day for what he's given me for not having to put me through hell that day or letting other people put me through hell that day. I ask him to forgive me of my sins. Those known and unknown. 
and I ask him to please forgive me for fornicating committing no oral sex. I also ask if he'll send their souls back to them and my back to me. And, and that's how I end my day. Take a big hit and fall asleep. I, I uh, smoke cocaine to, uh, a lot is to, uh, to kill the pain. I still have a broken back and uh, the cancer is uh, spreading rapidly. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just uh, in, in pain all the time. And uh, I take one hit to uh, take the edge off. Two hits is to uh, completely kill the pain. And the third one I can finally get high. So, uh, yeah, they're, um, they don't even leave me alone in my apartment. The locals here, they're, uh, they're breaking in my apartment. They wouldn't even give me any peace. They wouldn't even give me, uh, a sense of security in what's supposed to be a, uh, place of respite for me. And I'm tired. And I ask God every day to just please take me quickly. So my soul can finally be at peace. I don't even know if I'm gonna be here a week from now. Thank you for coming. Thank you for